I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, I'm all you need In the off-white Rari Baby, we run the streets I'm a K-I-N-G Westside royalty I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, that's all you need I'm a K-I-N-G Baby, I'm all you need All right, everybody. Welcome back to my podcast, Get It. I'm your host, Stephen Basito. We're on the Social Nostra Network. And today, joining me is fellow podcaster on the Social Nostra Network, Jeff Bloom. And I couldn't be happier to have him. Uh, he's got a podcast, and it's called The Bleacher Blums. And it's really a podcast that highlights baseball, um, Major League Baseball, Little Kids Baseball, College Baseball. Uh, they do talk about other little things. But uh, Jeff is also the announcer for the Houston Astros. And they finally got to start playing baseball, uh, what, two days ago? Yeah, they actually played their first exhibition game yesterday. They have another one today. And then if everything goes well enough, we will see actual regular season baseball this Friday uh the 24th so you know kind of exciting yet tempered excitement uh, down the stretch here so how's it looking now as far as uh for baseball because you know to be fully transparent here huge sports fan but i haven't really been plugged into baseball so much i do train some guys in the nfl which i've been working with through this shutdown time and uh they don't even think they're gonna have a season right now and so yesterday i was training several of them and they're like they quit. They don't get paid anymore. They were all getting paid stipends before. Oh, Nobody's getting paid. The players union isn't talking to them. Owners aren't talking to them. So there's this like blackout of information right now. And everybody said it from rookies to vets to like higher paid players. No one's getting anything. And so they're all like, dude, like they're not flying guys in for, they said, well, we all got to get tested. They haven't set up anything. Yet. So it's been very disorganized and this information they all have right now is non-existent and you know how it goes if there's no information and you let everybody talk things can get crazy so like right now they're just like dude we don't even think we're gonna play so i'm like all right so my focus has been really towards and then obviously the nba because of my basketball stuff and how it's affecting you know that that trickle down effect so what's going on with mlb I, are they doing are people going to be allowed to be at the games what's the format looking like give us a little bit of information yeah. So, it, well, I mean, first of all, the, the NFL and the, the NBA looks like they're in pretty good shape with their bubble, you know, zero out of 350 guys that have been tested uh, became back positive for COVID. So I think they've done a very good job in that sense where they've been extremely proactive, but it's a little disappointing for me to hear about the NFL. And I read some of the articles that, to your point that said that, you know, there's a possibility that NFL will not have a season. And that just shocks me because what we're talking about between major league baseball, NBA, NFL, NFL, and, you know, even to an extent, the NHL, these are billion dollar industries. So there is a great deal of cash flow and there's a great deal of revenue to be had. And, right. you know, the NBA made it a priority to figure out how to get the game back on TV and get them back on the court. Major League Baseball has done the same thing where they've been very proactive in trying to figure out how to get the game back on the field. And, you know, as it sits right now, there were some real issues with testing. COVID testing within Major League Baseball early on when their quote-unquote summer camp started, and uh, they were worried about getting the results back quick enough, and I think that they, you know, quickly they've been able to adjust to the climate and adjust to the atmosphere of having these tests come back quicker, and it's, it's given everybody a little bit more hope for the season to start on, you know, the 23rd and 24th, but it's also different than the NBA where you're actually seeing some of these teams travel. And like I just mentioned, the Astros are flown to Kansas city to play against the Kansas city Royals. So I'm kind of curious to see how that unfolds and how that actually worked with them getting on a plane, going to a hotel, going to a, a new ballpark, being in the same room uh, as far as a clubhouse is concerned, and then flying back to uh, Houston, Texas here in the next couple of days to start their season here at home. Uh, against the Seattle Mariners on Friday. So there's a lot of things I think that these exhibition games, we're going to find out about how it went. But ultimately it comes down to how often are they getting tested, which is every other day, and how quickly are those tests coming back? Because I think you know as well as I do, if you're in a work environment and you know that everybody was tested on the same day, but Chuck over there didn't get his test back in time, you kind of look at Chuck a little sideways and go, does he have it? Does he not have it? But when you find out nobody has it, you relax a little bit. But 
There's well, a lot of that, still moving parts. Well, my other question is here in California, you're getting your test back four hours later. Nice. So that's great. Are they not getting it that quickly down there? No, because I think the way Major League Baseball uh, has set it up, they, they, they wanted to privatize it and not get into the public domain and take tests away from the public testing right. in order to, to be politically correct, I guess. So they're sending, they're overnighting these tests to Utah and then they're overnighting them back as soon as they can. And that's how they're getting uh, their tests back. Gotcha. Yeah, they're not doing it in-house or on-site, uh, in, you know, in Houston or LA or anything like that. And, and I forgot to answer your question about having fans in the stands. You know, two months ago, when things were looking good here in Houston and we were going through our phases of reopening, there was actually talk of having 50% capacity. But I think right. those those ideas are long gone now. It's going to be no fans for the entire season. So are they just going to flood the stadium with noise then and just put sound speakers out there? Because that's weird to, like, not have yep. any noise at all. It's very bizarre. And if you've seen some of the highlights on Twitter or social media, I mean, it's thunderous when the ball hits the glove. It's this big pop. Or if a guy makes contact, you know, you just all you hear is the crack of the bat, and all of a sudden the voices of the players communicating with each other on how to uh, to to finish off the play. And I know that they are going to be piping in and using actually video game sound that they have for some of the video games in baseball and putting it through the speakers in the stands. Okay. And I think there's somebody might actually be responsible for the reaction of the crowd. There might be a particular Not soundtrack. Okay when the home team does good or when the, the visiting team does good, you know, you can boom. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, being on the broadcast side, I know for a fact we've had conversations about actually having that ambient uh, stadium sound in our, in our headsets. Okay. Well, man, that's crazy. So then, okay. Did you watch any of the MMA fights yet on fighters Island? Um, I haven't seen the fights on fighter Island yet. No, dude. It's so weird because you don't hear – all you hear is the corners talking. That's it because oh, they don't do any noise. So you have maybe two dozen, three dozen people in there, which are like doctors, you know, obviously refs, the, the ring girls, uh, management, you know, fight teams, that kind of stuff, right? And you have like, you know, some of the just, I think, general people that are associated with the company um, that are there, media, whatnot. But – Dude, it is quiet. So you just hear them fighting, which is well, kind of nice because I used to fight, and it brings it back to, like, you're in the gym, and it's just, just you. Just in the gym, just you two going yeah, at it, right? Just, yeah, and you can hear, like, when you're connecting punches, like, you can hear it. So it's pretty Ooh. cool to hear it, you know, and hear them talking trash a little bit. But, uh, well, yeah. But there's so much – I would imagine there's so much, you know, there's energy – provided by fans and I don't you know I don't know how I mean I would imagine it's the same way because we've both watched boxing we've watched watched UFC and I mean it, you know once you feel that momentum start to build and you feel the energy of the crowd I mean it just reinforces the idea of going out there and trying to beat your opponent and that's where I you know I'm kind of curious to see how some of these bigger sports not necessarily PGA or NASCAR where you're kind of isolated but you really thrive on the on the, the crowd noise well home field advantage is the real thing and, yeah. you know, it, it does like, I mean, I've been, I've been coaching and I've been a player. Obviously you've also been a player. Like you do get energy when everybody's hyped up and stuff and you get hyped up and it's this synchronicity, so to speak, right. Where you're energizing each other it's a good call. and not having that, you know, and then it goes back to like home field advantage is a real thing. And I'm from Seattle, die hard. Mariners fan, sorry, my man, mm -hmm. and Seahawks. That's oh, all good. I love and Seattle. <laughs> at one point, when the Supersonics existed, but like I've gone, I used to fly home and I, I'd take my dad to games in Seattle, and we would go, and it's no joke. Like I would leave there, my dad had to wear earplugs. I would leave, and my ears would be ringing for three, four days because, like, Seattle's the home of the twelve. And they got that name because they've been the loudest stadium year after year after year after year for years. And it is deafening in there. And look at all the – if you look at the false starts that happen in there, mm -hmm. it is, there's nobody even close to a second. And it's because it's so loud in there. And there's so many people, and they get crazy. And that's a true home field advantage. I can't imagine that not being there anymore. Yeah. 
No, I think it's, and actually the Seahawks are a great example of that because I believe, you know, when they're playing in the kingdom, obviously, you know, it traps a lot of the sound. And I know that from playing here at Minute Maid Park, when the roof is closed, it traps that sound and it can become very intimidating. But I also heard rumors that, you know, the new field that they built for Seattle that they've been playing in, it's a gorgeous site. But at the same time, I also heard that they built it in a, in a way that the acoustics would kind of force the sound onto the field to oh, take advantage it. of the 12th man, which are the fans up in the stands. And it, you're right. I mean, there, there's actual statistical data that proves your point that, you know, false starts are up, home field, you know, the winning percentage at home is up for the Seahawks. So it definitely has an impact. And uh, it, for, you know, baseball, I would imagine soccer is the same way, you know, watching some of the Premier League soccer games, not having the chanting and the, in the, Right. You know, the energy and the song and the, that goes along with that, it, that has got to be severely disappointing for a lot of those players that are on the field that are accustomed to having that behind them uh, and not having it now. It's a whole new uh, era of sport that we're seeing. That's crazy. Well, and I think part of it too, right, is that you live for that as an athlete. Like, yeah. you live for that – home environment you want like that's a huge awesome part of being a pro athlete you have achieved the highest level of athleticism and you get to have crazy sums of fans you know i was watching um i didn't get a chance to watch the michael jordan documentary the last dance um until last night my wife and i knocked out two episodes real quick and even in that you know they talked about how the chicago <laughs> The Chicago Bulls, oh, they were just so bad. All the guys were doing cocaine. Like, they were all just wrecked, right? They didn't care. Yeah, some of they those, those initial stories about that environment were a little frightening. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, like, if they got down, they gave up. And then here comes Michael Jordan, right? And how, like, tickets were selling. By the way, when I saw the prices of those tickets, I nearly crapped my pants. I was like, nine yeah. bucks for a suite. Can we go back? <laughs> What? Yes, please. I'm like, dude, come on. But it was insane to see. And then, like, how just that entire city became Bulls fans. And, like, every game was sold out. You couldn't buy tickets anymore. Like, it was just insane. And what Michael Jordan did, not just for Chicago, but for the sport of basketball, you know, obviously, yeah. I think as sports guys, we can agree. Like, I think he's the best that ever played the game of basketball, but I would say as far as like just an athlete across the board of all athletics, he's going to go down in history as one of the top 10 athletes ever to play a sport ever in the history of sports. No, his talent was transcendent, man. It was unbelievable. I, mean, I agree with you in the sense that he was one of those, those incredible superstars, but to your point and the fans and what a guy can bring to an organization like you said, he built up the fan base and so you start to build up this fan base and you start to create this, this atmosphere around a team. Guess what happens? Guys outside of Chicago all of a sudden say, I want to play with that guy. I want to play in Chicago because it's such a great environment. Yep. Yeah. And that's why you get these super teams. Yep. I mean, there's other reasons too, but yeah, I love it, man. It was, it was, uh, I remember watching, I remember watching Michael Jordan. I was, you know, a big Supersonics fan. So, of course, he won his sixth championship against my Supersonics. I was so pumped. I mean, I was happy for him, obviously. I remember yeah. game six. Me and my buddies had all gotten to one of my buddies' houses, and we're all kind of barricaded in the basement watching game six. Man, I love Gary Payton and Sean Kemp and Detlef Shrimp and all these yep. guys. It was such a good game. I mean, obviously, it wasn't great for me as a Supersonics fan, but – I love watching Michael Jordan, man. He was just such a dynamic and, and fun player to watch. He just, you know, it, it's hard to put into words. And so I get in these, these debates with like my high school kids who have never seen Michael Jordan play, you know, they know the name because yeah. it's a famous name, but they don't know. Right. So they want to talk to me about how they think Kobe Bryant's better. LeBron's better. And I, I knew Kobe when he was alive. Um, amazing guy. I don't, question that Kobe wasn't one of the top players to play the game. I'm like, dude, you guys don't understand. Like there's just, it's so hard to explain to you guys in terms of go watch Michael Jordan play, go watch old games. Like it's just, when you start to watch this guy, you'll understand that there is a separation between Michael Jordan, Kobe or Michael Jordan, LeBron. Um, dude, Michael Jordan was just the truest form of a competitor that you could be. Like he had to win no matter what, and he would just push every single person around him to excellence 
And that's just the kind of guy he was. And he was like that from the very beginning. You know, LeBron James and Kobe Bryant eventually stepped into those shoes, but they were never, I would say they were never like that their whole career. But more importantly, and again, I mad respect for LeBron. Anybody that's a professional athlete gets nothing but respect. But LeBron, we've seen him give up in games. And I'm sorry, but in championship, I've seen it in championship games, I'm sure you have, Mm -hmm. where he's gotten frustrated and he literally just gave up and sat on the bench and you could tell he'd given up. Michael Jordan didn't do that stuff. And again, it's a mentality thing. Like you cannot compare what Jordan had to really anybody else. They just, and nothing, again, nothing against LeBron. I like watching LeBron. I think he's a phenomenal athlete, but he is not mentally in the same space that Michael was. It just yeah, died. I think that's I, th- I think that's what the last dance actually showed because you and I growing up as kids watching Michael Jordan, you were, you were just amazed at the athleticism and the talent, and the creativity, and body control that this guy went out there and played with. And I think it was interesting the era he came in. You know, he came in in an era where there were there were big men, power forwards. You know, there was a one, two, three, four, five, and there was a specific guy that played that specific role. Yeah. And he kind of came in and goes, "I can be the point guard." I can be the shooting forward or I'll go down low and I'll start banging away with some of these guys to score points to help my team win. So he found a way to be, you know, yeah. hyper athletic and be, you know, uh, probably a little more versatile than, than anybody had ever seen. And now you're starting to see more athletes. I think Kobe might be the closest as far as mentality, but Kobe didn't come into the league. I think he learned how to become that Mamba mentality to go out there and overwhelm games, not, you know, just psychologically, Right. And, uh, you know, get his team to play better. But Michael Jordan, yeah, I'm with you in the sense that, you know, w- you know, a lot of people who haven't played sport might watch him in practice and go, man, that guy was a dick. But <laughs> you and me, we look at it, we're going, man, I'd love to play with a guy like yeah. that who expected competitor. out of me. Yeah, competitor. He just told everybody to be the best they could be. But, you know, also, too, just in the sense of, look, take away – Man, just go back to the beginning of his career. He didn't have a great group of guys, but he still went out there Mm -hmm. and got them to the playoffs. Like, to see his competitive drive and what he was doing and and his laser focus stuff, I mean, it was just – it was insane to watch. I have one of his – so Michael Jordan runs camps. And one of his um, coaches works for me and is with my – and is a skills coach for me. And I'm always bugging, like, man, listen – because he, he'll go have lunch with Mike. Like, they stay, they stay in contact. I'm like, listen, man, someday when he's here, I don't, like, look, I won't say a word. Just let me sit down with you guys and have lunch. Like, I'll sign paperwork that I can't say anything. I don't care what it is. I just want to sit there. I just want to be in his presence. I just want to have a chance to just, yeah, there's no way to put it. I just want to be in his presence. I'm not like this with anyone. I train professional athletes. I train um, music all the types of music people that are like, you know, you see on TV and you hear their music videos, you see, you know, I train actors and actresses. I live in Southern California. I'm, I'm connected to lots of different groups. I, they're all great people. I love all of them. If they remember watching this, this is not a shot to you. I <laughs> they're people <laughs> like Michael Jordan. I've grown up and he's been on this pedestal. I was just like, dude, I just mm-hmm. want to meet the guy. I felt the same way about John Wooden. So pissed. Yeah. This is one of my top regrets in my whole life. I had just moved to California. I'd only lived here for a couple of years. And I went to the, to the Honda Center, what they call the pond, and mm-hmm. watched the John Wooden Classic. I was three rows behind John Wooden, directly behind him. And, like, we got there early, and he was kind of sitting down. And I honestly, I wanted to shake his hand. I just wanted to meet him. My college coach had told us stories because my college coach had spent a couple of days with John Wooden. And I've read his books, and I've just – John Wooden for me was like, again, that pedestal. I just wanted to meet the guy. And I got so nervous because he had like, I I would say probably 12 security guards. It might have been more. And I'm not exaggerating. Like, they were deep on all around him. And I was just like, dude, I just want to shake the man's hand and just tell him that he impacted my life. And then he died the next year. And I was so mad at myself for not just – Look, man, like the one time I get shy in life, it's just like, dude, come on. What's wrong with you? And I've always said, you know what? Because of that learned lesson I had, because I justified it to myself. I said, you know what? 
he lives in the area. Like, I'm sure I'll run into him some point in life, right? There's going to be another time that we cross paths. No, there's not. Nothing's guaranteed. And I said, you know, from this day forward, I am never missing an opportunity ever again for the rest of my life. Ah. Yeah. If, if there's one thing we've definitely learned in the last six months is take advantage of every opportunity. <laughs> and I'm yeah. kind of with you in that sense. You know, you get around these people like, you know, I've had a chance to meet Mike Trout and talk to him. But when you, when you, when, when you are in sport or you see greatness, you want to be, like you said, it's, it's hard to explain because you just kind of want to be around it because they, I feel like they speak a little bit differently or you you're, might catch something that maybe somebody else wouldn't because of where you're at mentally when you're speaking with this person. You know, I, I was lucky to hang around uh, Tony Gwynn when I played with the San Diego Padres and he was a guy that you just kind of walked up next to and you're like, man, that's Tony Gwynn. And then he'd start talking and he, First of all, they're just people, which is great, right. but it's also right. the mentality is so different and they want to talk to you. That's what would probably yeah. be really interesting if you got near Michael Jordan is that he'd be, he'd be like, Stephen, let, you know, what do you got? Let's talk about something. And you're going to spark something in him that brings out a thought that you never even thought of. And I think that's the coolest part about some of these great players. You know, I've been with Jeff, two Hall of Famers, ba Bagwell and Biggio. Uh, and, and just being around those guys and uh, you absorb information from those guys. But I'm kind of curious when you're coaching your, your athletes and you know the greatness and you know the mentality of these guys, how do you translate that? Because when we, we play team sports and you say you've got to play great as a team, but I also, I think what gets lost sometimes is it's okay to be that aggressive, intense individual, because I feel like if you are, if you are exuding that work ethic or exuding that, ability to take it to another level or get in the zone like they call it you know it you don't necessarily have to speak it to somebody but your actions can right. kind of translate to other people so how do, as a young athlete how do you explain that to them or try and instill that in them? that's probably the hardest part isn't it yeah yeah so man that first of all that's such a great question um examples so i tell all my kids especially for my basketball club, you know, and I'll kind of make this twofold because I'm also a strength coach. I work with a lot of programs and athletes and then as a basketball coach and I coach. So first of all, find out, you know, most kids and I don't, some people may agree with this, some people may not, but most kids that play sports have an aspiration of being a professional athlete at some point in their sports career, right? Typically it's in that junior high, high school range before they really maybe truly understand the level of work it takes. Cause I will say that, that there is a drop off in high school of kids just because it's not fun anymore. It's not, yeah, this is uh, a great point. Yeah. It's not just going and playing. You get to have practice and it's a dad coaching. It's all fun and games, you know? <laughs> so there is a difference, right? And so people get to high school and they maybe not understand the full amount of work ethic, but for the kids that really do and are like, look, this is what I want to do. I want to play college. It's, giving them those examples and, and just really spending time talking to them like, all right, for me, the big thing is like, I know I'm your coach and I know I'm one aspect of many aspects in your life. So we go into, I give them podcasts to listen to. I give them books to read. I give them things to watch and say, these are things that you need to spend time in. If, if this is your goal and you say this is what you want, then this needs to become your life. And then them seeing those things and hearing those things and reading those things and watching those things gives them context i think because it's so many different people as people that have made it to those levels right it's the process of just constantly investing in how to challenge them how to speak to each kid as an individual know what motivates them individually i don't think a lot of coaches do that i think that's a weakness in the coaching world coach everybody the same all the time i say this you do it or i'm kicking you out kind of thing i don't think that's the right way to do it I would nope. say that I'm probably correct in that, given my resume at this point. Um, and a lot of it just boils down to, again, do you even like what you do? I know so many coaches that coach because it's just something to do. They are not passionate about it. They don't care if they win or lose. Gosh, man, there's, I just – it's tough. Finding quality coaches is tough. Yeah, uh, a couple of things on leadership that you're talking about, and it has shifted. I agree in the sense, you know, when I first got to the big leagues, it was, the, you know, this is my team. This is how my organizations run. You either fit in it or we're going to get rid of you. And I think it's kind of shifted in a sense 
you know, we got spoiled here in Houston having AJ Hinch here for four or five years. And I had a chance to speak to him specifically. And, you know, he was a, a baseball player at the University of Stanford <clears throat> and he got a psychology degree. And he told me that was probably the, you know, he didn't know it at the time, but that was probably one of the smartest things he did is because when he got his second opportunity to manage a big league team with the Astros, he actually he specifically told me, he goes, I have an idea of how to play the game. And so do my guys in the clubhouse. It's how do I motivate them to be the best they can be individually so that our team is better. And that's kind of to your point, you know, how, how do you motivate a guy? Cause a guy in the big leagues or in the NBA, you're going to say, okay, do you want it? Do you want a big contract? Is it money that's going to motivate this guy? Or is it going to be legacy for a guy like LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Um, is it winning percentage? Is it the guy that wants to go out there and win a championship ring? So you got to find those, there's certain motivating key factors for each individual and pick on those guys individually. And then when the team takes the field, then you can kind of broaden it out a little bit right. and manage your team to go out and win a game. Uh, but also it's, you know, a lot of these things that you're talking about and a lot of the things that I try and instill in my girls who are playing volleyball and, you know, the way I try and relate baseball to life is that there are so many redeeming qualities in being in a team atmosphere, the accountability right. Uh, the work ethic that you're talking about. I mean, these are things, even if you don't have the talent to take it to a D1 or a JC, but you have experience within that realm of playing a team sport and understanding what it's like to have that guy to your right or left or woman to your right or left understand that I need you to succeed. You know, that goes a long way in life, you know, so there are some really redeeming qualities that I hope a lot of these coaches take and instill in these, uh, you know, these student athletes or these athletes so that when sport, which is, you, you know, as well as I do, is a very small window. Once you get outside that window and you start to live a little bit, you can use some of those skills to attribute to a, to a pretty successful career outside of sport. So if you played a varsity sport, so I, I'm an exercise science major, and we had to do like these different wow. classes at the time, you know, different stats and stuff. And one of the things I did was a focused on sports specifically and like so if you played a high school varsity sport so this is back in 2005 2006 but if you played a high school varsity sport and applied to a job you were 85 percent more likely to get that job versus anybody else if you played a college wow. sport you were 95 percent more likely to get the job and if you played a pro sport, I think it was like, you know, you were basically guaranteed. The spotting was like 99% chance. And the reason for it, and they broke it down because there had been studies done where companies have spent a lot of money and they tested the qualities of people who had experience mm -hmm. in sports as opposed to your everyday Joe. Well, think about it. If you played sports, you know what hard work is, you know what discipline is, you know what teamwork is, you know what it is to follow, you know what it is to be a leader. Right, you have all these things. Adversity, pressure, that, yeah. Right, that other people don't have. And even for me, so, you know, we were talking before this, I'm making a small transition right now. Uh, and so I'm getting into a, I'm going to be working with a new company for a little bit here. Uh, or, you know, maybe for a long time, I guess we'll see. But for, but we're making the move. And, and with that, in my interview, they asked me, how do I do under pressure? And I looked at him and I was like, well, I mean, being under pressure is like breathing for me. You know, I owned three businesses at the same time. I was a collegiate athlete. I was a amateur professional athlete. I like pressure is my middle name. No, I completely agree on that. And, you know, it's all relative to your training. It's all relative to your preparation and, you know, we always make fun when we go to spring training, we always make fun because, you know, they're, they're doing pitchers fielding practice. We're doing cutoffs and relays again. We're doing bunt defenses again. And these aren't necessarily things that you do on a regular basis during the regular season, but they're the foundation. They're the, there are certain fundamentals that you learn in a game or at a job if you're trained properly and you're prepared well enough that that foundation that you're on is what you rely on when pressure happens. You know, I, I, it's kind of funny, you know, one of my favorite quotes is actually from a Chevelle song where it says panic makes remorse and right. it kind of pressure, pressure creates panic sometimes. And if you, the less you panic, the better you're going to do. 
but it's because you have that foundation and you have that preparation already instilled in you so that when things do get kind of fast, like we talk about in sports where the game speeds up a little bit, if you have that great fundamental that even though the game is moving faster than you, than you think it is, you still have that fundamental to rely on. So when the mind might be going chaotic, there's that, you know, that subconscious that goes, you're going to be fine. You've trained for this. You know what happens if this guy moves one way or if the ball goes that way. I make this move and it, it, you're going to be fine. And I think that's where you create that ability to, to perform under pressure is having that good foundation and being prepared for that pressure right. situation. So what has been one of the, I guess, biggest pressure situations that you've had to deal with? I'll try and talk through it. I hope it's not too bad. But uh, pressure situations, uh, you know, you're going to find out in parenting, you're going to have plenty more than you had on the field. But at the same time, you're going to use what you had on the field or on the court with with your uh, family. But uh, some of the pressure situations I found, uh, you know, it, the, the biggest one for me and everybody talks about late innings, you know, walk off home runs, game winning this or, you know, making a crucial play in a situation. And I was fortunate enough in 2005 to find myself in the World Series with the Chicago White Sox and tie game top of the 14th inning two outs and uh, I hit a game winning home run and you know that's probably what my career is most noted for is having that home run and it became you know it's a trivia question it's it's a part of history and it came at one of those incredible moments when I think the the viewing audience was about four million people and then you count the 45,000 people who were in the stands and you just start adding all of those those uh, components on top of it. And it, it sounds like a hyper-pressured situation. But to be brutally honest, it was probably one of the more comfortable situations I've ever been in in my life just because I, I was comfortable in the box. And uh, when things get a little chaotic in that, in that bigger scene, it seems like you have a tendency to simplify things. And uh, I just kind of simplified the fact and, and – you know, it's, it's actually understanding that you have more time than you think in those situations, too, to really use your mind to kind of settle things down. And, you know, I had a 2-0 and o count, so the count was in my favor. So as I stepped out of the box, I really kind of said, okay, this guy doesn't want to throw a ball. He wants to throw a strike. What is his, what, what are the, you know, what's the highest percentage pitch for him to throw a strike? So I said, okay, it's a fastball. And as I'm digging in, I'm saying, okay, he's probably going to give me a fastball. And then Everybody on the planet knows that my strength is on the inside corner and my weakness is on the outside corner. So I'm going, okay, he's going to throw me a fastball away. And, uh, you know, so really kind of put things at ease. And one of the greatest quotes that, uh, you know, or greatest comments that I've heard from a, from, an, from a teammate was a guy named Lance Berkman, who I played with in Houston. And this is where I was at during that World Series. He said, the dumber I am, the better I react. And I felt like that was one of the dumber moments because I wasn't thinking too much. Right. I had my game plan. I had my idea. I stepped in and I said, I'm just going to react to whatever he brings. But for the time being, I'm kind of thinking out here, but he made a mistake inside and I, and I crushed it. But, uh, you know, that was probably one of the more high leverage clutch situations that I've ever been in. And it was one of the more calm situations I've been in on the, on the field. It was amazing. So I actually watched that game and that's the only reason why I knew your name. <laughs> I was, appreciate that. that and that's the, the only reason a lot of people time. know my name. Yeah, and to be honest, you know, like I watch the Mariners and I know the players on the Mariners, but when you get into like outside of maybe the top 10 to 20 guys, I don't Yeah. I don't know. There's so many of them. And the thing for well, that, and, and too, like I don't like to watch baseball on TV mm. unless it's the World Series. I prefer to watch it in person. So every year I get tickets to go to the Angels and Mariners. I, funny thing is I actually train some of the Angels guys, and I go there and I root against them, and I have my – best part is, too, I'll even sit behind their – like I'll get front row seats behind the dugout, and as they're oh, wow. standing there along the fence, I'll talk trash to them. I've had security come over to me before and be like, hey, you can't see something. I'm like, they're my friends. I, I'm their strength coach. I know them. And they'll look around and be like, no, 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 get rid of them. Get rid of them. like, really, guys? You can't take it, Joe. We'll you know, back. security started taking me out one day, and they're like, "No, we're kidding. Like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay." One of the guys actually like started coming up. He's like, "Guy, it's okay." I was like, That's "You guys, hilarious. Are, like, funny. You guys, you can't just verbally spar. You have to have security come down." And but, yeah. um, yeah, man, I love watching those games. And you know, they win some, they lose some. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not one of those people that am, I'm never gonna get into a fight over a sports game, ever. Good. Now. 
if you endanger my wife or daughter and I'm at a sports game, that's a separate issue. However, well, that should sure, never be when it issue. says girl dad, that, that yeah. means watch your ass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hyper protective, man. But like, people do dumb stuff, man. I know alcohol doesn't help, but I know like a lot of sports fans, they just don't get it. Like, their whole life is wrapped up in that team and they don't have much to lose. And so I'm very careful. God forbid we bump into each other. It's immediately, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Like, I'm so sorry. I bumped into you. know, it's mm-hmm. like, People are like, hey, we don't, neither one of us want a confrontation, you know? Can I handle myself? Of course. I've been fighting for yeah. my whole it, life. It's cr- it, yeah, it's crazy. You, you have to pay for the expectation of decency. You know what I mean? It, it's too yeah. bad. And I mean, but, you know, ballparks and, you know, NBA arenas, all of these sporting yeah. events, are, it, it's basically just a, a melting pot of – of society that just comes in there and Tuttle and I have talked about it on our podcast about, you know, what is it being a fan? You know, obviously it's fanaticism is where, you know, you break down the word, but it's basically an irrational, irrational love for something that you can't explain, but it overwhelms you. Right. And it can completely alter a personality. I know you've seen it in playing with a guy yelling at you in the stands or, you know, or you've been in a game where, you know, the opposing team, and he's just absolutely airing out guys on your team, and you're just going, where is this coming from? Why is this dynamic created? Um, but one of the most fun experiences I've had in that situation, because, you know, I hadn't sat in a, in a, in a big league stadium in a seat since 1994, I think. And then in wow. 2017, when the Astros were in the World Series, I had the opportunity to go to some World Series games. And I actually got a couple tickets to, uh, I believe it was game two of the World Series in Los Angeles. Now, keep in mind, okay. I work for the Astros. Right. And I'm going to Dodger Stadium where I, I grew up watching games. But that, you know, that's, that has nothing to do with the situation. But, and I sat down and I know the history of Chavez Ravine and the fans getting crazy and this World Series hypertension. Oh. And throughout the course of the game, I mean, it was a roller coaster ride. Astros did great. Dodgers would come back. Dodgers would take the lead. Astros would come back. So it was a lot of, you know, that section standing up, me and my wife standing up. And we were the only two Astro fans out there. But it was but the part that yeah, really you were gave me. To be standing up at all. Yeah. I've been to Dodger Stadium. Yeah. And, there, you know, so we're, we're you know, we're kind of like, yeah. And everybody around us is going, oh, you know. <laughs> but by, by the end of the game, what was great and what actually gave me a lot of hope was is that we all got to experience one of the greatest games that any of us have ever seen in person. And as we, you know, the Dodgers lost, the Astros win, and I was happy. They weren't. But at the same time, we all kind of stood up and looked at each other after, you know, half dozen beers maybe or more. And we just kind of looked at each other and went, man, that was a good game. And you wish it could be like that more often. But it was one of the more pure experiences I've had at a stadium, sitting in the seats. It was amazing. Did you have security escort you guys out? No, I've got to – you know, I didn't have it out, but at the time, I, you know, they, I had a special uh, credential that didn't allow me to actually go eg- exit the stadium the same way that everybody else was. I did have a little bit of privilege in the sense that we got to go, you know, underneath the tunnel and out of the way of, of everybody good. exiting the stadium. Yeah. That's good. Because I was going to say, man, you guys have a parking lot. <laughs> There are people there that don't yeah. take me kindly. Like I, I had to learn a couple lessons the hard way when I was really young, and I first moved to California because I'm a I'm, look. I'm a sports fan. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. I love sports and I love sports in person. I've gone to yeah. UFC fights in person, NHL, MLB, MLS, NBA, all that. I love sports in person. Like that's my thing. My wife knows if she can't think of something for me, just get me tickets. College, pro, doesn't matter. <laughs> and it doesn't even matter the team. I just want to be there for the experience. So, but I usually, you know, I'll pick a team, right? Now mm-hmm. that I've been in LA for so long, I typically have home team stuff I wear. But if it is against a Washington State team, I'll wear the Washington State gear, you know. But man, I've had some situations where I was just like, maybe I should have thought the process out just a little better about either strategically leaving or like, you know, just being more mindful of where I had parked and mm-hmm. what was around me when I had parked. Yeah. I, uh, I left a baseball game and it was the Dodgers and it was a pre. you know, it was, it was, a uh, the Mariners were playing them. It was, um, 
you know, out of conference game and stuff. And mm-hmm. I was with two of my buddies, and they were in, and they were uh, Dodger fans. Okay. So this is my saving grace. So we're leaving together now. I was a couple of steps behind them because I had dropped something. I think I was texting somebody and I dropped my phone and I reached down to get it. And of course they were, they were still walking. Well, at this moment, now I'm by myself, right? They've, they've been walking. I grabbed my phone. I was looking at my screen and I kind of look up and there's just a lot of people. So I'm kind of wiggling my way through and a couple of Dodger fans have spotted me out. And I don't think that we even won to begin with, which is why I was a little confused as to why this was happening. Um, but they came at me and they're like, you know, started using some colorful language. And I was like, guys, it's a sports game. I'm not fighting over a sports game. Like, I'm from Seattle. I love my team. Like, it's not – I'm not talking trash to you. Like, why are you getting so heated? And a couple more people kind of joined in on this now. So it was like three or four of these guys that were all getting real aggressive. And, of course, I'm like, all right, man, like, really? Am I going to have to, like, go home and tell people I beat the hell out of some Dodger fans? And, you know, of course, they were all really drunk. Like, I don't drink a lot. When I do drink, it's usually just a couple drinks. And it's for the purpose of I like to be mindful mindful of my surroundings. I don't like to lose control. And I don't like to be in hostile territory either where I know something bad can happen. I like to make sure I'm present. So, of course, my buddies were looking around for me and decided to come back. And, of course, at this point, the situation has been escalating. You know, they're they're getting a little bit more – um, vocal. There's a couple more people that joined in the ranks now. So I think we're at like, you know, five or six people that were chipping in on this and all getting like, they were getting the physical stances that for me meant that they were ready to fight. And my two buddies came in and like, guys, relax. He's with us. And they saw the Dodger gear and stuff. And like, Oh, okay. And they like, let it go. You know? And I was like, thanks. Isn't it crazy how that disarmed them? <laughs> yeah. Because they don't want to fight fellow Dodgers. You know, I'm like, all right. Yeah. Well, I told my buddies like, well, thank you for going back for me. Like I thought I was going to end up fighting you know five six guys the only other time this happened with my good friends who introduced me to my wife now this is before i was married and they're married couple tiffany and scott so they take me to usc game because they're playing wazoo i'm a big washington state okay that's my that's my college my dad went there Mm -hmm. so i love wazoo football they threw me under the bus we've been tailgating and pre-partying for hours. USC is a party campus, man. Like, we've been drinking since, like, 9 a.m. The game was, like, a 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. game. Everybody oh wasted. And we're all funneling massive groups of people into these small little, like, walkways. Mm-hmm. Tiffany thinks it's funny. It's like, hey, there's a Cougar fan. Now, thankfully, we're all wearing the same colors. There's oh, no yeah, difference. that maroon, yeah. Right. So, I had actually walked over to throw like my beer away or something. And this group of like five, six guys come tearing after me. They didn't know what I looked like. They're like, kill the Wazoo fan. There was a group of them coming to beat me up. And Tiffany was like, just standing there quiet. And I was like, what'd you do? Help me She's out like, here. I didn't know it was going to be like that. And I was like, but you, but you saw them all come at me. I was like, well, you know, I didn't know if they were going to find you or not. And you know, you're doing it yourself. I'm like, so I'm going to be the guy that beats up a bunch of drunk college kids. What's wrong with you? And Scott yeah. was like, I would have helped you. Man. Her husband, by the way, is much bigger than I am. I'm six, three. And at the time I was like 210 pounds with like four or 5% body fat. So I was in good shape and I was fighting Scott. He's six, nine, like two seventy five, And he's like, Damn. he trained with me three, four times a week. He was a yoked. I think he probably would have just dismantled them by himself, but yeah, he would have just like, got you, man, I would have you. Yeah, I like, I wouldn't have let anything happen to you. I'm like, you, your wife, she's a troublemaker. <laughs> yep, yeah, stir the pot. So, going back to really our first part of even our conversation. So, with sports moving forward, what do what does it even look like for the next, you know, from high school to call, to college into pro? What are we looking like, or what do you think things are going to look like? Because we're talking about. Kids not even getting half seasons this year um, mm-hmm. in college, some in high school, depending where you live. How is that going to affect the pros? How is that going to affect the minor leagues? And then, you know, just in two with this whole like condensed season, it's not even a real season this year. Like how do you, what do you think the residual effects are going to be here? Uh, the residual effects in baseball are going to be different because of the negotiation it t- that took place before they got on the field. I think it was a real mistake by Major League Baseball. It was a mistake by the players to make a bigger deal out of it than that actually was going on 
So I think that is going to have a little bit of an effect. But I think getting back on the field, once everybody sees, you know, sports in action, when they start to see, you know, the NBA get back out there and, um, you know, and do their thing, I think all of a sudden it's going to bring back, you can be as angry as you want, but once you start to see your favorite team or your favorite athlete, you're going to turn a little bit and you're going to have that TV on in the background. You're going to start looking over your shoulder. Then eventually you're going to be watching that game as often as you can. And I think that's how it's going to be for baseball, just watching some of the exhibitions that are going on right now. Everybody that was so embittered to begin with are now excited to see those teams on the field. So I, that gives me hope. But I think the part that scares me the most is the amateur side. You know, I've got a daughter who's going to be a junior in high school, is relatively good at volleyball, is getting, you know, uh, recruited by, you know, colleges. And, you know, what happens to the recruiting process? Do the colleges now look at incoming freshmen or potential freshmen as a liability because they haven't had those full seasons to develop their athleticism before they come to college? Right. And is there going to be room on the college roster? Because we heard about some of the spring sports, you know, uh, you know retaining their uh, year of eligibility. You know, I think a lot of spring sports are going to have a lot of damage control with incoming freshmen and, you know, returning seniors if they want to come back. I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, you know, down here in Texas, I know that uh, their version of the CIF has actually pushed back fall sports. So you're starting to see football, which is amazing to me because, you know, and hearing all the stories and now living here after moving from California, Friday Night Lights is everything. You know, they have season ticket holders in high school football down here. And they're talking about pushing that into the winter, which is going to be interesting to see how they handle that with scheduling with basketball that uh, all of a sudden comes up. Um, right. So it's a little bit concerning for me because you're going to get, you're not going to get the exposure that you need as a high school athlete. And I know that there are recruiting sites. I know there's video. I know there's zoom and some of these other applications that you can watch some of these sports, but the college coaches aren't going to be able to, get to the court and see these kids play. They're not going to be able to get to the field and see these kids play. It's great to watch them on the court, but you know as well as I do, being a coach, you want to watch how that player interacts with teammates. You want to see how that player interacts with their coach. And there's a lot of things on the peripheral that you may lose sight of when you're just watching a player through a, a, a narrow lens of a Zoom call or a video camera. And I think that's going to get lost. But, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, fluid situations that are really concerning to me for some of those athletes and especially you know um you know in college football if if you're I guess Siri wanted to talk to me but uh you know you, a lot of these college athletes that are going to get drafted in the NFL NBA and uh, uh, baseball aren't going to have those full seasons to go out there and get recruited and if you know, you push NCAA football to spring and the draft is in April. Why would I go out and play if I'm a top prospect risk injury, you know, two months before I'm going to get drafted? So I think that right. there's a lot of concern with uh, amateur athletics right now for and me going what forward. All the uh, coaches that got furloughed and the programs that just simply said, we're not doing sports this year. Because how many colleges at this point from Power Five conferences, there's what, a dozen that are not even going to play this year? Yeah, I don't understand how that's even a possibility. I, you know, I, I went to the University of California, and I've been on plenty of phone calls in years past, around 2011. They were talking about getting rid of the baseball program along with several others. And so I was in on a lot of phone calls with that. And even now, I'm watching a lot of, like you said, Power Five conferences. And usually the big three are, you know, like basketball, football, and baseball. Right. And, I mean, women's basketball, a lot of, you know, some of these other revenue-producing sports are being talked about getting rid of. And it's mind-blowing to me. And I can't remember specifically. And I think, I think you're, you may know better than I do. But it was, I think it was an Ivy League school that took care of 11 sports and just got rid of them. I mean, you're not – and they may not be sports where you're going professional. But at the same time, you are crushing – you're crushing these poor student athletes who worked so hard to get to that division one point in their career. Right. And they want to finish out a full, full career right. at, a, at a school and have stories to tell and have that on their resume right. and have the experience. And they just step up and wipe this thing out. That's, that's very disappointing. I understand well, it's a tough time, but man. Well, then their thing too, is they're just like, Oh, best of luck to you. Cause I know kids that got their sports cut this year. 
they've called me like, and they're coach. just they just cut loose and it's just yeah, hey like, good luck with the rest of school i gotta go find a new team to play for i just got released like they're not honoring any scholarships and they're not returning us as athletes we're we've been with the scholarships too mm-hmm. and oh. i'm like and so like dude please help me i'm like dude I will definitely do what I can, but I don't know what I can do. Like I have coaches who've hit me up and they're like, Hey man, I'm, I've been furloughed. I'm not allowed to talk to athletes anymore. I'm not even allowed to talk to my own kids because I'm technically not working anymore until they figure it out. I'm just like, dude, there's so many athletes right now floating around. It's Mm -hmm. insane. I just, I, I see like what's happening right now. And you know, in California, same thing in Texas, they're pushing all sports back to December. I'm just mm-hmm. like, dude, how do you – all of a sudden your club sports can't – you can't do club, which is how you usually get recruited. Um, yeah. And I'm just That's like – That's the exposure you need. I mean, you're, you're – in one year like this, and I mean, even – we can even say a year and a half with what happened last spring. It could take three to four years to rebalance sports again from the high school level all the way through the professional <clears throat> level. I, I agree. And I was actually just going to, I completely agree. And I actually was just going to say, I mean, there's about a year and a half that you're talking about where you stunt the development of these kids. They're going to continue to grow physically, uh, emotionally, right. mentally, but they're, when they come back and sports actually gets back to where they want it to be, they're going to have to almost not relearn the sport, but they're going to have to adapt to the current situation of the sport because they've grown so much in the last yeah. year, year and a half, they're going to be a little bit behind. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. This is Stephen Masita, my podcast, Get Through the Social Notion Network. Again, joining me was Bleacher Blum's host, Jeff. And if you want to check him out, he's also on the Social Notion Network. Hey, man, I appreciate you having you. And we're going to do this again because we obviously can talk about sports all day long. Yeah, there's a whole lot of new aspects like we just finished with with this COVID crisis and pandemic. But uh, we talk a lot about club sports on ours, and I, I would like to open the invitation to you to have you on ours. Talk a little bit more about more, you know, being the parent and club sports and what that means for athletes moving forward. But it was great being on with you. It was an easy conversation, man. Yeah, well, let me know. I'm always up, and uh, take care, my man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good one. You too.